Tom Costello. So it seems that um, almost a very large number of people here remember a younger John McCarthy than I remember. I came to um, Stanford at the beginning of John's, I don't know if it was second career or 17th career, but in about 1990 until most of the rest of his life, John started again in some ways. This was after the AI winter, so Vladimir had just recently gone, and John started again with a new crop of PhD students. I don't know, perhaps John had PhD students, you know, but there had been a gap, and then there was, um, there was first Guha, who worked in, was very much in John's style, worked in logic and did contexts, and then there was also, he had another student, Sasha, Sasha Buvac, who worked in context, I see, Eyal and Arthi, who did elaboration tolerance, which was another major idea of John's, which was um, an attempt to try to write people, to fix the field, to get people back on track. This is one thing I remember with John, I worked with John for 10 years or so, was um, an awful lot of the time was like, he knew people were getting off track. If he could only get you all back on track, everything would be okay. And I hear all of these stories and I hear people talk. I've heard about almost all of you from John. I've heard stories of what you've done. And I've heard all of the little things John did to try and get you back to doing it. And I was thinking of Barbara Hooperman, Liskoff, Barbara, which John always called Barbara Hooperman. I presume you were called that at some stage. But um, I can remember I mean, when hearing the story of you describing it, it wasn't like that to John at all. John remembers, you know, you, he, I, he would always say, he had this plan, he gave you this stuff, and it was, he said it was perfect PhD to the setup, and he expected, I imagine right till the very end, that you were going to give up on whatever mistake you had gone off and, and come back. Because I think one of the, what he, what he told me your PhD thesis was on, which I, again, am not quite sure, now that I think of it, may not have been completely accurate. It was really John's core idea, which is making things better. In chess end games, if you've gotten a certain position, there's small things you can do which will get you in a better position. And of course, at the end of a game, if you slowly improve things, then you'll win. If you think of the simple idea of recursion and lisp, it's the idea you have a difficult problem, but if you can do something just to make the problem a little bit simpler, well then in continue doing that, you'll finally end up with solving the problem. If you think of circumscription, which is another of ideas, is that you've got this big idea, but if you slowly get rid of the abnormalities, get rid of the things which aren't quite right, well that'll get you into a better place where you'll actually find your answers. Because John was a huge believer that gradual improvement would get you to where you wanted to go. In some ways, um, John was a huge optimist. Like if somebody said radical optimist, yeah, John really was a radical optimist. And I think an awful lot of you don't realize the tiny little pushes he was giving you to get you back on the track of logical AI, which all of you were going to do if he could just <laughs> nudge you in the right direction. <laughs> um, John was, had extremely strong political beliefs. I don't think they would be fair to call them conservative. I think it was, they were optimistic. Um, he really believed in long-term projects, and I, I know one of the projects that I remember, I worked surprisingly long time on it now that I think of it, was that um, he wanted to move Mars into Earth orbit, because we only have one planet, but if we had Mars in Earth orbit, that would be two, and that would be like a big step forward. It turns out that it's perfectly feasible using current technology, and um, you basically knock, a, knock an asteroid out of the, um, the um, asteroid belt, and you slingshot it around, um, Around, around Earth and, um, and Venus until, Mars and Venus until they transfer momentum from one to the other. And it turns out there's an issue with angular momentum. Of course, if you drop Mercury into the sun, that will solve that problem. <laughs> um, John really liked the idea of changing the number of planets from nine to eight, okay? Because it was a classic example of one of these things which was a true but like wouldn't change. John never saw the idea of demoting Pluto his dropping Mercury in the sun seemed a lot more sensible to him. <laughs> the other thing is that John was immensely creative. One of the things, I'm, uh, John wrote a huge amount which he never published, like Alpha Beta Pruning. A lot of his best ideas are written down. He wrote, would write them down, but of course they would just sit there in a three-letter directory name because of course he, that's the way he named everything. The, um, the one thing I'll just tell you about is um, 
He thought Tolkien was terribly negative in Lord of the Rings. He really believed that orcs were salvageable because John was an optimist. He believed you really could get them back. The, the, he thought the elves were very much like environmentalists who didn't like change. <laughs> he hated to see the waste of technology. The ring was technology to him. And so he has this sequel where he, they divert the river into the Mount Doom. They retrieve the ring and of course, the properties of the ring are separable because it's a process similar to chromatography where you put it on a gold bar. The various properties like invisibility and evil will migrate at various different speeds. John was nothing if not creative. And there's um, fragments of this lying around if you can actually dig it up and read it. But I think that that shows that in everything, John was an eternal optimist. And um, as such, I'm sure right now he's expecting you, having heard this, to say yes, I really should go back and do that logical AI. <laughs> Now we have Ted Selker.